Today's khutbah is called The Day We Lost Our Masjid. The Day We Lost Our Masjid. Even though Bradford is full of masajid, do you feel you have lost your masjid? Inshallah, today we will answer this question. But before we come to the question as to whether the masjid has gone missing or not, I wanted to speak about the role of the masjid in Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, three days before he passed away, where was the last public place he was seen? The last public place he was seen alive was in the masjid. And in the famous incident, which is also known as the last smile, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose home, or the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, he adjoined the masjid. So he removed the curtain, and then he saw Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu leading the Muslims in prayer. And then he smiled. And the companions, even though they were in prayer, they cast a look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the corner of their eyes, and they saw him smiling. And they were very, very happy. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, maybe he had recovered from his illness. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he smiled, and the reason he smiled was one of many reasons. And one of the reasons could well have been the fact to see his companions assembled in the masjid behind the leadership of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he dropped the curtain, and then within three days he passed away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another hadith which shows the excellence of the masjid, albeit indirectly, is the hadith that there used to be a woman who used to come to the masjid, and she used to clean the masjid and pick up the litter with her own hands. And once this woman, she died. And the companions, they did not inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, they washed her body, they, they put the funeral shroud on, and they prayed the janazah, and they buried her. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he only heard about the death of this lady the next day. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard that this woman had died, he then said to them, that why did you not inform me? And they had not even thought to inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This woman was insignificant. All she was, was a cleaner. However, the difference here being that she was not any ordinary cleaner. She was a cleaner of the masjid. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he honored all the Muslims. And he specifically honored this woman because she looked after the masjid. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then went to the graveyard and he found her grave. And then he offered the janazah prayer on her grave as though he had attended the Suratul Janazah, the Janazah prayer. So we see here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to really honor the masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he even said that of the seven who will be shaded on the day of judgment, on a day which nobody else will have the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne, one of them is a man or a, a young man whose heart was attached to the masjid. That he was always in the masjid. Whenever you ask about him, they say he's always in the masjid. So these are the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor on the day of judgment. So now let us ask the question, like, what is a masjid? The word masjid in Arabic, it comes from the word sujood, or the word sajda. Everyone know the word sajda. Seen, jim, dal. These are the common letters in the word masjid, and the common letters in the word sujood and sajda. So quite literally, the masjid is a place you make sajda'in, you prostrate, you put your head on the ground to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many, many actions in the prayer. So why is the masjid not called, not named after these other names? And the reason being that a sajda is the most honorable position to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that a person is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he is in his sajda. So make dua or supplicate to Allah more in your sajda. So for this reason it was called a masjid, to honor the position of sajda. So without any doubt, the main reason why we build the masajid is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more, more importantly, to offer the prayer. And more importantly than that, to offer the sajda. However, the tragedy is that many people, they have restricted the meaning of the masjid to a place of sajda. There are many, many masajid, the hundred plus masajid in this city, many of them. They are just a place of sajda. The only thing you do there, they desert it, they wake up at prayer times, the, the muaddin, he makes the adhan, the iqama, and then the imam, he leads the people in sajda. So masjid is a masjid in the very, very technical linguistic term of the masjid. However, is this the meaning of the masjid in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And the answer is no. We find other masajid through the world, they've been <coughs> turned into tombs. That you bury a holy man inside the mosque, and then you circumambulate, you go around, you make tawaf around the grave. Other places, the, the mosque has become a church. Other places, the masjid it has, has become uh, a museum. So the masajid, they have, they have changed uh, in usage 
dramatically. And uh, the very least can be said is that the masjid has become a place solely for prayer. So brothers and sisters, let me introduce you today to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was more than just a place of putting your head on the ground. There are many other terms which are confused with the masjid. Another term is musalla. Maybe you heard the term musalla. The word musalla means a place you pray in which is not a masjid. Like in Muslim countries, in many countries you have the masjid, and next to the masjid you have a plot of ground which is used on the day of Eid to pray the Salat al-Eid outside. And this is called the musalla. And it does not take the same rulings as the, the masjid. Another term you often hear is the term Islamic center. What's the difference between an Islamic center and a masjid? Islamic center is a new term. And the reason why the Islamic center, the term was coined was because the masjid was not doing what the masjid was supposed to do. When you think of a masjid, you think of the imam and you think of the prayer. But you, you don't think of other activities. So some Muslims, they applied the term Islamic center to the masjid, meaning let's restore the masjid to the proper use of the word masjid, which is more than just a place of prayer. So when I refer to the masjid in this khutbah, I'm actually referring to an Islamic center. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first man, Adam alayhi salam, he tells us in the Quran, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ وُدِعَ لِلنَّاسِ لَلَّذِي بَكَّ مُبَارَكَ وَهُدًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ The first house Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he built was a masjid where in Mecca the old name being Bakka so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he valued the masajid to the extent that he ordered Adam alayhi salam and some of them say that Adam alayhi salam he was the first one who built the foundations of the Kaaba and then this building it was revived in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has praised the masajid and I will come to some of these ayat uh, later on inshallah also the Prophet sallallahu he encouraged us to build the masjid or the Islamic center in the true sense of the word masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu he said that whoever man bana lillahi baytan bana allahu lahu baytan fil jannah. That whoever built a house for the sake of Allah, Allah will build for him a house in paradise. Many people they spend their whole lives working 25 years for that retirement home, pension scheme. Whole life thinking how I'm going to relax at the end of my life. And the reality is the relaxation is maybe 5-10 years. And then it's time to die. So the real relaxation is the relaxation of Jannah. This is the real retirement home. And as the financial advisors, they say, always invest in bricks and mortar. They always say this, that whenever you have money, always put it in bricks and mortar. So we say that the best bricks and mortar and the best retirement home you can have is the home of the masjid. So if ever you come across an Islamic center or a masjid which is worthy of support, then make this investment and prepare your retirement home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he praises the people who look after these masajid and build these masajid in the Qur'an in more than one place. And Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةَ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That those people who raise these masajid, or these Islamic centers, and build them, they are the people who believe in Allah and the last day, and they offer the prayer, and they pay the zakat, and they fear none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi he also said that the masjid is the most beloved place to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the most hated places, they are the places we spend most of our times in. And they are the masaj, they are the markets. The markets are the most hated places. Why? Because when you see that great deal and the sale, then you, you are furthest away from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you come to the masjid, then you are the closest to remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now let's look back 1,400 years to the masjid of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa First, we should know that the first masjid that was built in Islam, I'm sure many of us here, we have already been to it. And it's Masjid al quba And this masjid in Medina was the first masjid. And uh, it was built of clay and its roof was made of palm tree branches. It was a very, very simple building. However, it was more than just a place of worship. In fact, it was the headquarters of the Islamic State. It was the headquarters of the Khilafah was this simple building. And it had a multitude of roles. It was a multi multifaceted role for this masjid. First of all, we know that the masjid was a place where the children, they were welcome. Children, they were welcome in the masjid. And there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he was in the masjid of Nabawi and he was carrying Umama, his granddaughter, the daughter of Zainab, and he would carry her in the prayer. And when it was time to make the sajda, he would put her down. And when it was time to get back up, he would carry her again. And also we know that in Ramadan that the companions, they would take their children to the masjid and they would make them fast and they would spend the time in the masjid playing with bits of cotton wool 
to uh, take their minds away from the, the pangs of hunger. So the children, they were welcome in the masjid. Were women welcome in the masjid? Yes or no? I remember one brother, when I used to work down south, he told me, when I said to him we should have sisters in the masjid, he said, not over my dead body. Not over my dead body. This reminds us of the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar, radiallahu an, who spoke to his son Bilal, radiallahu an, and he said to him, that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say that do not prevent the female slaves of Allah in going to the masjid. What did Bilal say? Bilal said similar to what my friend said. He said, not over my dead body. When Abdullah ibn Umar, he heard this statement, in, in the hadith it says, he cursed him in a way that he never cursed anybody in his entire life. And these are the exact words in the hadith. He cursed him in a way he never heard, uh, anyone had ever heard him curse anybody else. And he said to him, that I told you that the Prophet ﷺ said, do not prevent the female slaves of Allah from going to the masjid. Yes, the, the, the home is better for the women as a place of prayer. However, do not prevent them. And then Bilal, he, the son of Umar, عنه, he said, not over my dead body. I will never let them go to the masjid. So his father cursed him. And it is said that he never ever spoke to him ever again. And then he died without ever speaking to his son ever again. Because he had rejected the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ at face value. So the ulama, they made excuses for Bilal radiallahu anh, the grandson of Umar. And they, they said that at that time, <coughs> things had changed. And the women, they had become very lax in the hijab. And there were other reasons which prompted him to try to prevent women from attending the masjid. And the general rule, we say that the women, they are not to be prevented from coming to the masjid. Rather, we, we should maybe even encourage them in this day and age when education is little and social problems are many. This is now a time for the women to play a role in the masjid. The masjid was also, in addition to being a women's club and a children's club, it was also a university. It was a place of learning. It was a new place of learning. How many masjids in Bradford? They do not have any educational program apart from Surat al -Jumu Many, many. In fact, the vast majority of the masjids in Bradford, I guarantee you, they have nothing apart from the Friday khutbah and if people understand the Friday Khutbah. That's the only education they have. We find that the masajid in the history of Islam, they became universities like Al-Azhar and the Umawi uh, Masjid in Syria, uh, Masjid Al-Zaytuna in Tunis. But these places, they became universities. They started off as small circles with the Sheikh, reading the books <coughs> of the students. And before you know it, they were graduating Imams, and the graduating people with master's degrees in Sharia. So the Muslims, they were at the forefront of education from the masjid. And now today, we need education even more. We need to educate our children. Our children, they spend far too much time at school, far much too much time on the internet, on PlayStation. And they never get away from these other things, which are all giving them da'wah. We now need to bring our children back into the masjid. And we need to have meaningful programs where we can educate our children. Otherwise, they'll be smoking hashish or shish somewhere on uh, Lam Lane. So we need to bring our children back into the masjid. We need, the masjid is a place of reform and a place of education. The masjid is also a place for the poor. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there used to be the Ahl Sufa. There used to be a place in the masjid which was specially dedicated for those people who were poor, who had nowhere to live. So then they would live in this special quarter in the masjid. And uh, also travelers, they would come there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever the sadaqah is arrived, he would distribute some of the sadaqah to these poor people and have mercy upon them. So uh, this is also a, a place, it's like having uh, some kind of charity office <coughs> inside the masjid and distributing the charity there and then. The masjid was also a place of socialization and entertainment. Nowadays you go to the masjid and you have that sign, silence in the mosque. You ever seen that silence in the mosque? Now they have no mobile phones in the mosque. So uh, there was silence in the mosque. We find in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, yes, the masjid it has sanctity. It has sanctity, however, it's not like a monastery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Christians that they invented this concept of being a monk, of having a monastery, of having silence. The silence was a form of worship amongst the Christians. Yes, you should not shout in the masajid. In fact, shouting in the masajid and raising voices in the masajid is from the signs of the day of judgment is approaching. However, at the same time, there can be some socialization inside the masajid and there can be some entertainment inside the masajid. We know that Aisha radiallahu anha, she put her chin on the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she was within her home and she watched the Abyssinians having a spear throwing competition within the masjid. Within the, within the masjid al-Nabawi, they were throwing spears for entertainment. They were like training in the masjid. 
And Aisha radiallahu anha, she spent a long time observing them. And then the Prophet said to her that, have you had enough? And she said, yes, I've had enough. And then she dropped the curtain and, and they went indoors. So they, they used to uh, hold entertainment inside the masjid. Of course, within the parameters of Islam. Masjid was also a think tank. It's a place where meetings were held to discuss matters which concerned the Muslims. Like in the famous incident of the ifk, which is when some of the hypocrites, they slandered Aisha radiallahu anha. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered the entire community and he asked them that what do you think about a man who slanders my wife? So he held a public meeting in the masjid. So the masjid was a think tank and it was, it, was a, it was a place where the people they would gather on all important, all important occasions. It was also a place of military significance that when the Mujahideen, they would go on an expedition, they would always meet in the masjid and take instructions from their commanders and they would train in the masjid the masjid also became a field hospital like when we see the conflicts in Egypt and in Syria you find many a time that the wounded they are ferried to the masjid you might think why the masjid is supposed to be for prayers the masjid in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was also used as a field hospital in the battle of Khandaq the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he led some of the wounded into the masjid and he even erected tents for the family members, such that they could be accommodated within the masjid and they could visit uh, the, the sick there. The masjid was also a place for relaxation, meaning just to sleep. That many a time you go into the mosque and you find someone sleeping in the masjid. And it was allowed in the time of the Prophet just to while away some time in the masjid. The Prophet once found Ali radiallahu an on the ground uh, sleeping. And then he saw that his cloak was covered with dust. And he said to him, Oh, get up, Ya Aba, ya Aba Turab. Get up, or father of dust. They called him father of dust because he was covered in dust at the time. So it, it was a, a time where the companions, they would eat in the masjid, and they would also sometimes take rest in the masjid, take the siesta in, in the masjid. So here we see, brothers and sisters, the masjid was not only a place where you just open it up and you lock it up. It's a place which was vibrant. It was full of life, and people were always coming and going, undertaking multiple functions. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulil kareem amma ba'd. The masjid is not a free-for-all, you come and do anything you like. First of all, there are some rules in the masjid, and the rules of the masjid go as follows. First of all, when you come into the masjid, the first thing you should try to do is you should try to offer two units of prayer. This is from the rules of the masjid, it's recommended. If you don't do it, inshallah, there's no problem. However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said that nobody should sit down in the masjid until he has offered two units of prayer. The second and maybe the most important rule in the masjid is that there should be no business. We shouldn't turn the masjid into some kind of trade and commerce center. <coughs> Rather, the masjid primarily is for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that if you go to the masjid and you find someone trading in the masjid, then make a dua against him and say, uh, may Allah make you uh, make you lose money in your business. May Allah make you unsuccessful in your business because you have changed somewhere which was essentially built for the remembrance of Allah into, a, into something which takes you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masjid should always uh, smell nice. It should have a pleasant smell when you come into it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he forbade people from eating raw garlic and uh, raw onions because also it harms the angels. When you stand in prayer, never mind, it also harms the other people who pray. What about the one who smokes? It's a dirty smell. So if somebody, unfortunately, they smoke and they shouldn't be smoking, at the very least, they should clean their mouth before they attend the masjid. Uh, from the rules of the masjid is that there should be much remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala says in a beautiful ayah in Surah An-Nur, فِي بُيُوتِنَ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُ يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ in, book, in houses where Allah, He has given permission for them to be raised, that the people, they remember His name and they glorify Him by day and by night. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He praises the people who, they are always in the, in the, in the masjid. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves this masjid. Or he, he loves the whole concept of the masjid. He describes the Muslim, He says, رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَن يَتَطَحَّرُوا Wallahu yuhibbul mutahhirin. That these are men who come to the masjid, they love to purify themselves. And Allah, He loves those who purify themselves. So, in the end, what do we say? We say that, why should we even have a masjid? Is it okay to pray at home? And the answer is, yes, you can pray at home. Of every Muslim man, at the very least, you should go to the masjid once a day. At the very, very least. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, loves these masajid. And some of the ulama, they even made it an obligation to pray all the prayers in the masjid if you are able to do so. So uh, we should try to just leave the home once a day. We're all busy. Everyone's busy. However, alhamdulillah, Bradford has been blessed with more masajid than many, many other towns. So we should, we should try to go there and we should uh, try to get to know the brothers and there are many, many uh, advantages of this. Moving back 1,400 years back into Bradford, in the early 60s where our, our Salaf al-Salih, when our pious predecessors, our fathers, they arrived in this city. And now you see these mills. This is where many of our fathers, they work in the early 60s. Then there was no masjid. And in 1960, there were 3,500 Muslims in Bradford. 3,500. And then today, there are about 100,000 plus. So it's gone up by 97%. The, the number of Muslims in 50 years, so 3,500. The first masjid that was founded in Bradford was in 1959, and I'm sure many of you know this, in the city centre in Howard Street. And may Allah reward those brothers who started that masjid in Bradford, because it was a great Sadaqah Qajari, and most of them, they're probably buried somewhere, somewhere in Bradford. So these brothers, 1959, they started the first masjid in Bradford. They understood the significance of the masjid. The Muslims, anywhere in the world, whenever they invaded a land, the first thing they did was they built a, a base, a satellite station of the Kaaba. They built a base where people could, they could go, and they could know one another, they could solve social problems, and they could organize themselves. It should not be like a church, or a gurdwara, or a mandir, which they're locked up 24-7 along Leeds Road. I never ever in my life so far saw that gurdwara open. Maybe I missed uh, the birthday. But uh, anyway, I never, I, I never saw it open. So that was 1959, Howard Street. Now we have the first purpose-built mosque was in Tawakkulia Mosque on Cornwall Road. That was 1980. And I will remember when I was a young boy going around door to door with my dad collecting money for Tawakkulia Mosque when it was a steel frame. So this was in 1980. So we see now the expansion of Masajid. That now, alhamdulillah, we have many Masajid. The problem with our masajid is that they now need to take on board the role of an Islamic center. They need to be more than a masajid. They need to solve the problems. We have Islamophobia. We have our children. They are misguided. There are so many problems in society. Our sisters, they're suffering from depression, from domestic violence, from so many things. And there's nowhere to turn. Our brothers, they are looking for wives. There's nowhere to go. We need to develop the masajid and make them into Islamic centers, places where you can come, you can take advice, and where you can feel it is home from home. So we need to... Uh, Revive these centers. We need to make these centers 3G compatible. 3G compatible means that it's three generations. We need to have the granddad, we need to have the dad, and we need to have the grandson as well. And inshallah, in the future, 4G as well. But uh, let's start with 3G compatible first. So the masajid, they need to move into 3G mode. We need to get the granddads, and we need to have some younger guys there as well, and we need to wake up the whole uh, masjid. So revitalization and rejuvenation of the masjid is very, very important. That us as a Muslim community, we can never rise to the challenge of da'wah and preserving our Muslim identity for another 50 years until we change the concept of the masjid. The masjid, it has to move. And we should remember the masjid, who does it belong to? Does it belong to the trustees? Does it belong to the committee who are constantly fighting amongst one another? Who does it belong to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا In the masjid, it belongs to Allah, and don't make dua to anybody other than him in the masjid. So the, the masjid belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then it belongs to the community, and the people who run the masjid, they are servants of the community, and the masjid should not serve them. The masjid should serve the community, and first and foremost, it should serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revive these places. Just that they become our true homes. They become places where we feel relaxed in. Places we seek solutions to, from. That we, we, we look to the masjid as a beacon of light where we can turn to. And inshallah, we can improve our communities. And we can become 3G friendly, inshallah.